Hi there! I see that there's some interest in the way that I build my little circuit boards, so in this episode I'll take you through the process of exactly how I do that. So let's get right into it. This is the circuit board that we're going to build today. You recognize the circuit board from the MagnaSign video. This is a small double-sided circuit board, and I figure that I'll show you how to make a double-sided circuit board, and really by doing that, uh, you, you will also learn how to make a single-sided circuit board. Really, all you're doing is eliminating one layer. And it also uh, allows me to show you the packet method, and um, of course, um, I do the toner transfer method. And it's a little different than, than most, but um, I'll get into that when we come to that particular point. Now the program I'm using is TraxMaker, and TraxMaker is a really neat program. It's really versatile. I really enjoy it. Uh, I'm using it on a relatively old computer here, and this computer is basically only used for circuit board design. And it's off the net now, and uh, you know I've got some CAD, other CAD programs, and, and uh, I have a very extended TraxMaker uh, library in this. So, uh, you know, this is kind of a, an irreplaceable uh, program right now since I have so many boards stored in here. Hundreds and hundreds of circuit boards are, are on the, the drive of this computer. And when you start making uh, circuit boards, you're going to want to have another drive to back them up. Don't, uh, don't ever leave that to one drive. If you make lots of uh, special little circuit boards like I have and uh, your drive fails, you want to be able to get those back again. So it's always very important to back up your work. Uh, I've got some boards that I've spent days on, very, very complex boards. And um, every, you know, if I work on it one day and then, uh, you know, the next day I come back and the next day I come back and the next day I come back, every day I back that up to the external drive. If something was to ever go wrong, you know, you'd, you'd be four days of work or something like that would be gone. So it's very important to have an external drive to do this. And if you ever start building these and you spend time on this, you'll be thinking about that. That'll be right at the top of your head. If you know something ever fails, you lose all your work. So you want to be very careful with that. Now, most of these uh, programs will default to two colors. Uh, the top layer, like which is green here, uh, would be red. And then the back layer is usually blue. Now, that's very hard to look at for an extended period of time. So I changed my colors to green and black, and it's easy to remember because the black is the back side and the green is the top side. And then of course this is just the standard, it's kind of a brownish color, is uh, the pad layer, or both layers, they call it board layer. And uh, it'll be, you know, the back side and the top side. So this is much easier to stare at for an extended period of time. Now, when you're working with this board and you're laying components out, you got to remember that you're looking this way through. You're looking at this and you're seeing the, the back side of the board as if it was transparent. So all the components on the back side of the board have to be mirrored in your mind as you're installing these or laying these out. So a normal SOT23 package transistor, which this is, is a BC817, would be base collector emitter if I'm looking at this from the top side. But you have to remember, oh, I'm soldering this on the rear side, so that has to be mirrored. This is base, this is collector, and this is emitter. So you need to remember that when you're working with components on these boards. Everything that you lay on the top side of the board, if you visualize it on the top, it will be the same. But if it's on the back, it has to be like this. And when it's like that, of course, everything is mirrored. So you have to keep that in mind. That's uh, sometimes where things get a bit confusing, and that's where double-checking your work really pays off. So these components here that you see are through hole parts and all these pads here, they, they show up on both sides of the board. They'll show up on the top print and on the bottom print. Now, since these boards don't have any plated through holes, what you're doing is you're effectively soldering the component on the top side and on the bottom side. That's basically all you're doing. So you're using the leg of the component as the, as the plated through hole, really. Now, if you'll remember, I have positive and negative wires coming to these uh, 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 posts right here or to these uh, little pads here. So I just solder the wire on both sides. What I do is I pre-tin the wire, and if, if that's going to be too big, I'll just add flux to the wire. I'll, tin, I'll uh, solder it on the, on the top side, and that'll kind of pre-tin the bottom side, and then I just 
tack up the bottom side. So as long as you know you're not leaving excessive lengths of wire, uh, you know what you do is I push the wire right down to the board so the insulation touches, and then I pull it back just a little bit, and then when I solder it, the little solder ball comes right up to the insulation, and it looks really quite neat. You don't have excessive wire hanging off the other side so it can short, and it just looks like it's been soldered on both sides. Again, you know it takes a little bit of time to get used to all of this stuff, but uh, that's the way it goes. Now, since this is showing both sides of the board here, I'll just get to the to this other side of the board here. I'll get rid of the top layer, or actually no, I'll, I'll get rid of the bottom layer. And uh, we'll just look at the top layer here. Now, you'll notice that there's no traces connected to these pads here. I leave the pads here because I'm prototyping. And when you prototype, you're gonna be drilling these out with a Dremel. So I have a Dremel press. You can't just have a normal Dremel and Dremel these out with a small drill bit because you'll be snapping drill bits like crazy. You do need a Dremel press or a very, very small uh, a jeweler's drill press or something like that you'll have to have. You can't just do this by hand. So, um, and I'll get into that here in a little bit. But I leave the pads on the top of the board even though there's no traces. And the reason that I do this is because I don't wanna be flipping that circuit board back and forth on when I'm dre uh, dremeling this, you know, take the board out, flip it over and then drill this side and then drill this side. I just wanna do it all through one side just to cut down time. And by having these little pads just sitting here, it doesn't hurt anything. It's just, um, well, it's less copper in my etchant. So, <laughs> so it can just stay right there. And and uh, it looks absolutely fine. There's a resistor that sits here, so I can actually solder the resistor, lift the resistor just a little bit and solder it uh, on both sides. And it looks really quite nice when you do it like that. There's a cap that sits here, that HE uh, a series cap by Nishikon sits right here, and it sits right down on these pads, so you don't even see the pads on this side of the board. Now, of course, the upside to uh, working on a circuit board like this here is you can get rid of all the perfection imperfections that you've made before you're gonna export this to some sort of a PC board house. And that really is the whole idea of doing this. If you wanted to have hundreds of these made, you wanna make sure that you everything is perfect. You don't have any stray lead inductance that's gonna cause issues. If you're making an RF circuit board, you wanna make sure that everything's hooked up right. You wanna make sure you're not having any problems with interference or feedback or oscillation or anything like that. And that's where proving things out on a circuit board like this is absolutely fine. And of course, you get a really professional product done when you do it the way that I do. And you could actually just keep using it like this and it would be absolutely fine. Like you see, I, I make lots of these circuit boards and use them everywhere. In fact, I've even potted some of them as you've seen in some of my other videos and they're, you know, they're absolutely fine. There's, it's a, a really professional job when you're done. In fact, um, you know, when you make something like this and, and you coat it with a lacquer or anything like that, or just, you know, as you tin it like I do, you know, really what's the difference aside from having parts marked on it and, and you know, the coating on the board and maybe plated through holes, that's, that's it really. So I can make say, I'll make 20 of these boards in seven minutes. So I can make, uh, I'll print out 10 on one row and 10 on another. I have a big vat and I put this thing in a, in a vat and it takes roughly seven minutes with a heated solution and it's done. I have 20 boards etched off ready to go. So all I have to do is drill them and the drill time for a board like this would be about a minute, something like that. Aside from these two holes here because I would drill these out to 632 and that's for those large screws. So, uh, but then again, if I had all the boards, you know, like if you pre-drill these out with the, the drills at the actual Dremel, when you go to a drill press, it's a guide hole, a larger drill press, and it's just like zip, zip, and it's that fast, you're done. So you can see that there is quite a time advantage to, to doing this at your, at your own home, and that rather than exporting this to a PC board house. If you wanna do a bunch of prototypes very fast, you can do this and it works out very, very well and you get a very professional result by doing it this way. So now when you're printing this thing out is where things get a little bit confusing and you need to remember this. If you're gonna do this, you wanna mark this down on a piece of paper. This is important because you'll forget this when it comes time to get into the print section. The top layer, which is a green layer, when you're in your print menu, is mirrored. The back side is not mirrored when it's printed, so you don't mirror the rear. But any printing that you do put on the back side, you can see how I've put this here on here, this has to be pre-mirrored. 
so that you have to mirror it before you actually uh, you know go to the print so this here is printed backwards or in a mirrored fashion here on this one side if you don't if you have it see how this is just written Carlson here if you had this the same way on in black here on the back side of the board this would be completely backwards so that's where it gets a little bit confusing the top side the green you see is mirrored in the print menu the black is not mirrored but any writing has to be mirrored on the actual board and now uh, that's really the only confusing thing now I have two printers hooked up to this I have an ink printer and my uh, HP uh, a laser printer now I, I test all of this on my ink printer. I'll print this off on the ink printer very quickly and I'll lay components on here and make sure nothing's touching each other. You know, the spacing's right. Things like uh, this SOT23 package uh, a transistor isn't too close to this hole here. So when I put a nut driver on to tighten the little transistor down to the heat sink, it's not going to touch the collector. And things like that, you know, uh, make sure that the tantalums aren't too close to the pins here. And of course, if you want to default, you know, F3, it, you know, it'll default you to the, the actual real size of the board here. And uh, you can kind of look at it on the screen and get an idea. Of course, I always pre-print and, and um, you know, pre-check everything before I do anything. So a couple of things you want to keep in mind. Um, what else can I tell you here? Um, uh, the, the toner cartridge in a regular HP printer, like I've, I've got an HP printer I got from Staples. It's an $80 HP laser printer. And, you know, they come with a trial cartridge and it's got about, oh, you know, a quarter toner inside of it or something silly like that. That lasted me two years of making circuit boards because, you know, really, this is all you get, right? The, the rest of the paper's all blank. Uh, when you're doing RF circuit boards and you have a lot of fill everywhere, if there's lots of fill, you know, for, uh, you know, ground plane layer and stuff like that, of course, you're going to go through toner quite a bit faster because there's big, thick chunks of it written everywhere or, uh, you know, printed onto the... Uh, onto the layout everywhere. But uh, you know, for most cases when you're doing circuit boards like this, they last. Like I got years out of that first one. I've replaced that toner cartridge since, and I imagine it'll probably go until the, the printer doesn't work anymore. So uh, the printer is off all the time. You know, I only turn on my laser printer when I build circuit boards. Everything else comes out of my ink printer and my ink printer is wireless. So all the computers around here do it. And I've got computers strewn everywhere in here. So, uh, you know, I've got a laptop right here. I've got the old computer here. The computer I do my videos on is upstairs. There's another computer over there. It's, they're everywhere here. So, so this one, my ink printer, which is just out of the shot, it's right over on this side here. Uh, if you look at my lab video, I think you can see the printer sitting on that one side uh, that's the printer I use it's another HP uh, office jet pro 8600 my, my ink printer it works very well I've never had any grief with it and it wirele wirelessly links to everything beautifully so uh, I can just print stuff off from anywhere uh, anywhere in the place here so again this this uh, this old fella here he's retired but uh, you know great for circuit board still this is the original this is the original screen you know that came with the printer or that came with the computer and uh you know the tower is all fine and um you know i've been through it and just take care of the old computer and uh and it just keeps going and going and going so um it's a great computer old hp uh old hp computer from way back in the 2000s so that's how this is uh really done i hope i've covered everything here i just want to make sure that i'm not um uh you know leaving anything out here so really uh oh the borders here you'll see that i've got little green kind of uh corners here uh, i draw a box on the screen first in in the actual real view so I'll, I'll draw a box and that's the size of the circuit board that i'm going to make so it's a complete you know square this is the uh, the top side trace and I just draw a complete box and then I work within that box so I don't exceed that size and then of course when I come back up to here and fill the screen you know I know that I can't exceed this boundary because this is going to be the size of the board that I cut out and I cut all my boards in a bandsaw so I've got a, a sharp blade and a bandsaw it's actually a metal cutting blade it's a very fine tooth bandsaw blade and then um, what I do is uh, before I print this off, I, I cut the other lines out so this entire line isn't here. These are just guides for cut, for uh, using the bandsaw. And I'll draw with a ruler. I'll join these sides here to here to here to here. And then I'll, I'll cut this off in my bandsaw very close to this. And then I've got a bench uh, a bench grinder that's really has a slow turning wheel on it. It's for knife sharpening. It's got a really huge wheel on it. 
and I'll take these and I'll, I'll plane them on the side of the wheel as it's turning and it planes this stuff completely true and uh, you get very square circuit boards out of that now of course you can't do that for extremely large boards you got to make sure your bandsaw uh, you know uh, your your bandsaw cut is really nice and square if you're concerned about that and if not you could file the edges with a large file or plane them if you have a very big plane but for this it, it works very very well I'm, I'm basically making small circuit boards all the time i've made some larger ones like you've seen in the nixie tube my very first video which was that nixie tube uh that monsanto nixie tube frequency counter uh there was a a, a rather large board made in that one and a, uh, that you know that was basically a complete redesign of that nixie counter but um you know, that was you know, lots of through hole ic's on that one and lots of vias and stuff like that uh, so you can you can check that one out if you like just look for my very first video it's video number one uh, so what I do is I just trim these off and then uh, I leave these here as just guides for cutting it. And that's really all that this is here. So I kind of draw that around. There's a couple, you know, tricks of the, the, the trade that you learn after a while, after you prototype for so long, it gets really, really fast. As I say, like I, I can, you know, make these boards in no time at all. I can print, you know, seven minutes is the rough etch, etching time in a heated solution. I could have 20 of these boards done. Again, not drilled or anything. And that's another thing of why I like to make surface mount boards because there is no drilling. Most of the boards that I, I do make, uh, you know, that are, are going to be a 20 off or something like that. If I make 20 of them, they're all surface mount. So there's no drilling. It's just basically you etch them, you tin them and they're done. You just cut, cut them out and that's very, very quick. So uh, in the time that it takes, to, again, to export all of these to a PC board house, uh, you're, you're finished your run and it's out the door and they're gone already, you know, well before you would ever receive this. Now, again, you can only make a double-sided board in here. You can't go, you know, quadruple layer boards or triple layer boards or anything like this. So you are limited to a two-sided board. Now in the print menu here, I'll just show you the print menu here. It'll it'll give you an X scale and a Y scale. It wants to be at one. I have it at three because I print these out. I'll print this thing out much larger on my ink printer and then I draw in all the sizes. So what I do is I'll, I'll you know, mark that there's a one mic tantalum here, one mic tantalum here. You know, I'll put this as a BC817 and this is that 2N, whatever the number was, uh, a TO220 package transistor. This is a cap and this is a resistor. And I'll mark it all in their values and everything on a big piece of paper so, and put it in a file. And then I just look this up the next time I want to make it, look at my file and I've got all the component values there. So that's why it's at three. But uh, you make this for one for the actual print. So X scale is one, Y scale is one. And then when you go into the options menu, uh, if you're going to batch print, the top layer is mirrored. The bottom layer is not mirrored. Uh, the board layer, you want to include the board layer. Obviously, that's the brown ones here. All right, the pads, of course, you want those. Uh, the vias, yes, we don't have any vias in here. This is the vias, and I haven't got any vias in here. Uh, text strings, yes, of course, we want all the text strings. Uh, the path file name layer, no, don't want this on there. That's needless. And the single layer pad holes, I don't want that checked off either, because if I check that off, it'll leave these holes in the SOT23 pads. When I print this off, it'll leave these little holes here in these pads here for the tantalum caps and stuff like that. And I don't want any of those there. So I don't want to check that off. I want these little solid blocks. And uh, really after that is you just hit print, send it to your laser printer and you'll get two copies. One, the first one will come out mirrored, which will be the top layer. And then you'll see the backside will come out on another sheet of paper. So you need to load your printer with two pieces of paper. And uh, I'll get into uh, explaining exactly how, um, you know, what kind of paper and, and how all that works in the next shot here. So that's really what you end up with. And then um, I'll show you how to link those up. So uh, that'll be the next uh, shot here. Before we go printing this off on the laser printer, we want to print a mock circuit board out on just a regular piece of paper. And I use my ink printer for this. And this is so that we can size up a piece of circuit board so we get minimal amount of waste. So I've got a cutting board because, you know, I make quite a few of these little boards. And if you're going to do a whole bunch of these boards, uh, you know, owning one of these cutting boards really does make things quite a bit nicer. And this is the one with the laser in it. I don't know if you can see that laser glowing. Yeah, you can kind of see it back there. And if I slide the paper in, you might even see it along the, the edge there. So that really does make things quite a bit nicer. Now I've got these little alignment edges left here. And then what I'll do is I'll put this over to the alignment edge like this. I don't know if you can see that on camera and I'll cut that off there 
and then I'll slide this over and uh, this is where using that laser really works because you can't see through the paper, right? So then we've cut this off here and I'll run it through like so and I'll just uh, I'll line that all up. It's kind of hard to do this around the tripod, so I'll just uh, one more to go here and there we have it. So now this is the size of our circuit board and you can see it's got nice clean edges. I just, uh, you know, I could have cut this a lot cleaner if I wasn't around the, the actual tripod. It wasn't exactly square there. But this gives us the rough idea for, uh, you know, for cutting a piece of blank circuit board out. So what I'll do now is I will go grab a, a small piece of circuit board and explain the next step. Now that we've got our little piece cut out here, this is our size reference. You want to go grab a piece of scrap circuit board or something like that. And uh, this is just out of my, uh, you know, circuit board piece bin. I've got a whole bunch of just random pieces. And then now uh, what you're going to do is cut your piece of circuit board just a little bit larger than the piece of paper. Because, of course, again, this is our size reference. So now you want to make sure that it's double-sided. It has to have copper on both sides because we're making a double-sided circuit board. And then once you've got that all cut out, you'll end up with a little piece that looks like this. Now this is a little bit excessive again. Let's get the lamp up here a little bit. This is a little bit excessive again, but um, I had this piece already laying around. I didn't actually have to cut anything, so I just opted to use this. Now you'll also find that the more, uh, if you leave a, a little bit more between your uh, layout and the edge of the board, like you can see this is all gonna be cut, this is scrap, the better the chances that your board's gonna turn out perfect. If you cut this really close to the edge, you know, there's a chance you might lose some of your lettering or something like that. The whole idea is this is gonna get fed through a laminator and that roller has to come up on top of this and roll this down flat. So if you give it just a little bit of a lip so that the roller can come in true, you'll find that uh, your layout will pretty much turn out perfect the first time, every time. So you may find that uh, it's worth to leave just a, an extra little bit of circuit board and uh, deal with a little bit more scrap so that way you don't have to do this over again. And uh, in the end, if you ever make them like this, you'll, uh, you'll understand why it's worth leaving that little bit of an extra gap. This is, again, just a little bit excessive. I would have cut it, you know, a little closer to the edge, maybe like so. But um, this one here is, is a little bit big. Again, it's just a scrap piece. So it's got to be double-sided. And before you go about, you know, finishing this off, you got to make sure that you deburr the edges because if you cut this in a bandsaw, that's how I cut all of this out, right? Uh, you get burrs of copper on the edge. So you want to make sure that you file the edges to make sure they're smooth because you got to feed this through a laminator and you don't want these, you know, that, those copper burrs to cut the rollers in your laminator and that goes for both sides. So you have to file both sides and make sure the corners are nice and dull. And um, then after you've done that, sand this up with 800 grit sandpaper. So sand it up, and then once this is all sanded and, and you know it's evenly sanded on both sides, then what you're going to do is you're going to take some brake cleaner, uh, uh, or you can even use acetone or something like that, and wipe this off. And just because you don't want any of that excess copper or even dust on here, and you don't you don't want any oil from your fingers on this because that'll affect the toner. So we're not at that point yet. This is just our mock print up here just to get the size and this doesn't really count for anything except for sizing up a piece of circuit board but um, in the end I'll show you that it's very important you don't want any dust on here and I'll show you how to use a piece of the scrap paper we cut to, to scrape this and make sure that there's no dust on here because any dust will cause the uh, that toner not to bond properly so it's a uh, it's a uh, kind of a little bit of a process but you know through doing this you know so many times it, it, you kind of end up perfecting this all so in the next shot here, what I'll do is uh, I'll, I'll print up the two sides and I'll show you how to you know slip this into the packets and make the little packet up. And then after that, it will be into the laminator. All right, I'm going to try and do this uh, around the tripod here. So here we have both of them printed off. Now I've printed this onto, this is double-sided glossy flyer paper and it's designed for an inkjet printer, not a uh, not an actual laser printer. Okay, so this is these are designed for uh, uh, an, an ink an ink printing. And the reason that I've done this is because the toner doesn't stick to this stuff all that incredibly great, and it transfers very very well. 
So now what we need to do is we need to cut these in strips. Of course, we need to leave a little bit more than what we see here on the actual arrows or on the, uh, the edges here. So I need to cut this just a little wider than the edge on each side. And I'll show you that right now. And of course, it'll be the same for the back side. So I'll come in here and I'll take a look at what we've got. And that looks about good. All right. Now, you don't want to make a bunch of copies of these and save them uh, because this works good about uh, oh, 10 to 15 minutes out of the actual printer. So that's the best time to actually do this. Now, you see how we have one, the full length of the piece of paper here. This is the full length. Okay. So now what I'm going to do is, I'll just put this down here where it's safe. Now I'm going to cut this one here the exact same way. Okay. So this has no indexing on the sides, but I'm really not too concerned about that. I'll just cut it a ways away from the, um, from the lettering. All right, make sure that that's somewhat square. I'll cut it there. Okay, and I'll move this over to here. To watch the uh, little screen on my camera, I'm just about to bump it with my head. Okay, here. All right, now you'll see that this one is, you know, roughly the same length as the other one, right? Okay, well, we don't want that, so we're going to make one just a little bit shorter, but not too incredibly short, but just a little bit shorter. Okay, so I'll take this side here, and I'll just cut it off, oh, about there, and about there. So now we have one that's just a little bit shorter from side to side. Now what I've got here... As you probably recognize, this is an old overhead projector. Now, this old overhead projector allows me to put this on here. Usually what I do is I have a, you know, some paper up here so that this is a Fresnel lens-like thing, so you don't want all that light shining in your eyes. So what I'll do is I'll turn this on like this, okay? And this allows me to see through this piece of paper, and then what I'll do is I'll take this here, all right, and I put this on top like this, and you can see how they're mismatched. I don't hope you can see that in the lens there. And then what I do is I bring them right till they're matched, and I can see the little holes. Like if you look through this piece of paper here, if I get a uh, flashlight, you see there's little holes in there. See the little holes? And I can match those little holes up on this here using that lens. So I can see right through, and I can see the actual light come through both layers. So when I have both of these matched up perfectly, so they're right on top of each other, what I do then is I get a piece of tape. All right, I hold this really steady down here. I usually have a piece of tape already on my finger, like so, all right? And then what I'll do is I'll match these up as close as I can get them, and they, they match dead on. And then what you do is once you get all the little circles lined up, you hold this down and you put a piece of tape on this end and then you hold it down like so, roll your hand over, make sure the lines are all still lined up, pull another piece of tape off and tape it on both sides. Now, when I have that all done, because I can't do that on the camera with me bending over the tripod and everything here, I'll be back and I'll show you what I've come up with. Okay, so now that I've got this all taped together, which only takes just a matter of seconds, all right, you'll see here that it's, it's taped on each end here. That's the reason that we stagger cut these so I can tape this on here. That's the reason I trimmed that little bit off so I can tape it. If not, you're taping it around the edges and it doesn't work very well. There's absolutely no movement between these pieces of paper when you put two pieces of tape here. Now, if you look here in the camera, you can see that the holes perfectly line up. See that there? You see straight through. See there's light coming through those pad holes. That's because they perfectly line up from side to side. All right, it might be a little harder to see these. There you go. So you can see that, just have to hold the paper tight. So now, that's what this lens helps me do on this old projector. Now you can pick these old projectors up for 20, 30 bucks. And uh, that's what I did. I found one on a CL there and uh, picked one up. So now that we've got this done, we want to take our, our piece of freshly sanded and clean, this has been cleaned with brake cleaner, uh, uh, our piece of circuit board here, double-sided circuit board. And what we want to do is we want to use these alignment tangs that we had on the edges, you know, those little kind of half 
there are those little corners there and we want to slide this right between okay so what I'm going to do is put this here and that's roughly about center right there so once you get your circuit board in there and it's all centered up you can just pretty much hold it like this and then it's ready to go like this. So now what's going to happen is when I feed this through this laminator, it's going to perfectly match up both sides because they've been taped and aligned here. This goes through the laminator a couple of times like this, which I'll show you. And then what I do is I trim the, the edges off with an X-Acto knife really close in, that, in the junk area that we're going to be cutting off so that we just have two pieces of paper stuck to this copper by the toner. And then we'll feed it through a bunch more times. And then what we'll do is we'll peel the paper off and we'll see what we're left with. So that'll be the next step. So now I've got to go get that uh, laminator and uh, I'll show you that. This is the laminator that I've built. This is a uh, just a, a regular, you know, laminator, Staples laminator. And there's a blower fan on here to cool the gearing on this side that I've added. There's a power transformer here to power up the little circuit board that's on here. And this is the temperature controller that's inside controlling this laminator. Now I had to modify the, the actual the throw. You'll see this, this uh, color of this LED change when the, uh, the temperature gets up to temperature. And that's 207 degrees Celsius is how hot this is. So it's an extremely hot laminator. And of course, if you build anything like this, you, you know, you're doing so at your own risk. You really burn yourself bad with this thing. But uh, that's the temperature that this is at right now. That the air that's coming out of there is just incredibly hot. So this will come up to temperature even with this blower fan going. The speed is reduced at this uh, on this fan here. And what happens is, is this, uh, this unit here has got two silicone rollers inside of it and two really large pieces of aluminum that heat those rollers up. Now the aluminum doesn't touch the silicone rollers in there, but it's enough to heat those rollers right hot. Now there's, I, I've used a diode for sensing. You can see it's up to temperature now. Uh, I've used a diode in here to sense the temperature on this, so I've modified this quite a bit. As you know, this is like nothing like a normal laminator anymore, but um, uh, there's a diode that's uh, on one of the uh, aluminum extrusions inside here that do the heating. There's uh, heating elements on both sides, and that senses the temperature, the internal temperature of this. All the wiring that I've put in there has got that high heat sheathing across it in here, and um, you know, uh, again, this fan is only here to keep the gearing cool so that the gearing doesn't melt. And, uh, you know, I've used this for, what, four or five years now, and uh, it works absolutely fine. So uh, there's uh, been no grief with this whatsoever. The diode that I use in here, uh, this will be a video within itself one day. Uh, there, there's a lot of explanation to the way that this thing is put together. But you can buy laminators now that, that go really, really super hot and that have quite a throw. And what I mean the throw is that the actual rollers will spread apart a long ways. A normal laminator, you can't feed a circuit board through, it'll just jam in there because the lam the actual rollers are only designed to go apart maybe the thickness of a couple sheets of paper. And um, you know, this of course you had to modify it so that the rollers will, you know, I can fit a piece of FR4 through here, no problems, or any kind of board for that matter. I, I want this to, to accept all my circuit boards. So that's how this thing really works, just quickly without getting into the, uh, you know, the gist of this. As I say, this whole thing will, will be an entire video within itself, how to make one of these things one day. Uh, again, you know, just a regular run-of-the-mill laminator. So, uh, you know, uh, uh, the fan is epoxied onto the side. And these, this is the control circuit board here. And uh, there's another board here, which is a little fan, which keeps everything cool on there. So, and uh, that's really how this whole thing works. So what I need to do now is uh, grab that circuit board again here. So now I usually wear gloves when I do this, but um, if I'm really, really quick, uh, you know, it, it doesn't hurt that incredibly bad. <laughs> so uh, uh, what I'll do is I cut off the excess. Now you have to leave the tape here, but I just cut off anything that I don't need. So uh, there's a little bit of paper left. You know, the tape comes right to there, so you can't cut through the tape. If you cut through the tape, you're, you're uh, kind of messed up at this particular point. So now what I'm going to do is uh, feed this through the laminator a couple of times, just like this. I'll start here, and I'll feed it through. I'll see if I can reposition the camera and get all of this on the camera. And uh, if not, I'll have to just do this, um, you know, off camera. This is just a, a huge tripod right in front of me here and everything, and this is really hard to do. 
So uh, I'll try and reposition things and see if I can get this all in there. And uh, if I can, um, I'll, uh, I'll do that. All right, so I slipped my gloves on here just so I don't burn myself. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to feed this through the laminator just like this. And I'll let that press that down tight on to the uh, circuit board there. And I'll do this once or twice. Okay, it's off on the other side here. And I'll do it one more time here. I'll feed it through. And then what I'm going to do is grab my knife. And I'm going to cut the excess off here really quickly while it's still hot. So hopefully I can do this all on camera. So what I need now is a ruler. So this is going to cool off rather quickly. And uh, this is really hard to do here because it's, uh, I'm not, uh, this is not my normal area I do this in, but this only works with the actual camera. So. Okay, so there's one side there. Other side there. I'm gonna flip this over. You gotta be very careful with these knives in your fingers. So. Okay, so now we'll see that this is, you know, just like this right here. Okay, so there's no excess paper. And as quickly as I can, I want that back in the laminator. So I'll slip a glove back on because it usually does get pretty hot. One glove is a lot of the times enough. Okay, and a... Uh, Quick little shuffle there and back through again. This end is the hot end of my laminator. It's really hot at this end. There's a bit of the fans blocked off on this end, but this end is the hottest. So I use this for small boards. I always just stack it at this end, but it'll work anywhere in here. I think I can get one or two less passes by doing this. So then what I'll do is I'll put it through kind of like this so that it'll get the corners. You got to make sure that it doesn't hit when you're putting that through. You got to make sure that you size that up. And I just put it through a bunch of passes like this. And then when it's done, I'll just use something to, you know, quickly pull the heat off of it. And you just use this piece of circuit board here and press it against this. And I'll just show you. I'll put it through one more pass and I think we're good. Okay, so now what I want to do is put that on my bench top and just press it down and try and sink as much heat off of this as I can while holding it tight against the bench. So I'll move it over because that part of the bench is hot and of course this part of the circuit board is hot so we'll do that again. And usually by about now it's uh, you know really you can handle it. Yeah, it's just finger warm now. So I just sink the heat off on the bench a couple of times. Turn this back down to cold because I don't need this anymore. So there's a little lamp that means cool down. It just, you just ignore this lamp here. And uh, that's really what happens. So now what I need to do is let this soak in some water for just a, oh, maybe about five minutes or something like that. And uh, I'll get that all prepared right now. And then I'll be back and I'll show you what we do with this. All right, the next step here is we've been soaking it in water and we want to press 
all of the water into the paper as much as we can so that the paper is completely saturated. Now this is double-sided glossy and I think the next time I'm going to try just single-sided. I think I did try the single-sided one other time but this seemed to work better but I might just buy another package of it anyways just to try it out. But this works very good this stuff. It's just that since it's double-sided glossy it takes a long time for the water to permeate this paper. So once this has happened and you've, you know, you've pressed all of the, you can't really see any white anymore. What you want to do then is you just grab the, the paper and very, very carefully peel it back. All right. So you can see here now we're just peeling the paper off ever so carefully. And you can see we're left with a, uh, with a layout on the printed circuit board. Now what we do is we go to this other side here. And we do the same thing, just carefully peel it off. If the toner is stuck correctly, when you're pulling this off, nothing will come off with it. So if you notice that if you sometimes you'll you one of the corners might go missing or something like that, that's okay as long as the, you know the most of it's there. This one here, everything is all there. It's because we ran it through the uh, the laminator quite a few times. So now what I do is I get a little bit of water on a rag, and you have to get all the paper out of all the little holes. So, um, I don't know if you can see that on the screen there. All these little holes in here, they all have a little bit of paper stuck to them. And you need to get that paper out of those holes so that when we do put it into the etchant, that the uh, it will etch those little holes out or, you know, we won't have, uh, we won't get uh, the proper etching here. So what I'll do is you want to make sure that you know you, you keep your paper a little bit wet so that you don't go taking off any toner. Now you got to keep in mind that this toner is on here extremely well. Like this uh, this toner is, is part of this copper right now. In fact, it's uh, a lot of the times it's pretty hard to get off. So that's one of the tricks of having the laminator up so incredibly hot. You want that laminator as hot as possible and uh, you know so that it's not going to cause any problems to the board or anything but you also want it to to transfer it now there is a fine balance you know if it's too incredibly hot the uh, the toner will smudge and this kind of stuff so it is a fine balance i found that 207 degrees or 200 and you know between 200 and um and 210 is absolutely fine so once you you think you've got it all cleaned off here i'll just uh, see if i can find my flashlight again once you've got it all cleaned off here again, you want to make sure that, uh, you know, there's nothing in the holes. So you have to look over this very carefully under, under the light and then look at it kind of on an angle and make sure that there's no paper stuck in those little holes. And if they are, just, you know, give it a bit more of a scrub with that rag and um, make sure there's nothing there. So this is clean. There is, there's no paper in any of these holes or anything. So uh, this should etch pretty nicely and that will be the next step. My etchant that I use is just standard ferric chloride. Now a lot of people want to use this new uh, uh, thing that they're doing. They're using a uh, peroxide and they're mixing it with something and it becomes cuprous something or other. You know what I'm talking about. It turns green. The problem with that particular formula is that you only get really one go out of it and it's got to go. And, uh, you know, if you, if you try and reuse the formula, again, it's, you know, it's picky and, you know, you have to, you know, you're continually playing with chemicals. This uh, ferric chloride, this mixture, will stay good for about, oh, 30 or 40 etches. And even though the, the copper sits on the bottom here, it'll just keep etching away. It just keeps going and going and going. And, uh, you know, there is no problems with this. Of course, you have to dispose of this correctly. You know, you, you don't want to be doing anything stupid like dumping this down your drain or anything. But you have to dispose of this correctly. Whereas the other stuff, they say that, uh, you know, there's a chance of you doing it, but there's still copper in it and all this kind of, uh, all this kind of stuff. But at any rate, you get much longer life out of this material or out of this chemical than you do out of the other one. And you can just pop it in whenever you want. Now, what I do is this, this is a sealed container. There's a rubber gap basket inside here and it's it's called a glass lock container so what this is is it's a it's a glass container here and there's a, a big rubber seal on the inside so when you clip the lid down it completely seals the chemical in there so when you're actually using this stuff 
nothing is spilling out and going all over the place. Now I heat this this uh, jar up. Just uh, you know, uh, the hot water out of a hot water tap is enough to heat this up to make this stuff work a lot better. Ferric chloride, when it's just warm, it uh, etches quite a bit faster, and I can get. Oh, uh, you know, about seven minutes worth of time this will sit in there and uh, it'll be completely etched at that point. So that's what I'm going to do now. I can't do that here and I have to do this in, in a different area and it's hard to get my camera in there. I really need a, a camera person to be, to be doing this around me. So right now it's just me. So uh, what I'll do is I'm going to pop this in here. I have to heat this solution up. So basically it's just another little tub of water around this that's warm. And I put this inside there and then I'll drop this inside here and then I'll just move this around here for, oh, about seven minutes. So I shake it back and forth and like this. Keep in mind this is completely sealed so nothing comes out. And then uh, when we're done, I put this on top of a towel and I pop the lid open and, uh, uh, you know, I'll check this out. Now a lot of the times I'll shine this flashlight here, which is... Uh, batteries are going haywire but I'll shine this flashlight through the bottom of this and uh, I'll look at the circuit board to make sure it's etched before I actually open it up and when it's completely etched then I do open it so I'm kind of prepared at that time so that's what I'll be doing next and um, I'll come back with the etched board the circuit board is done it was only about five minutes in the solution it's relatively fresh solution so uh, it went really quickly just you know mildly heated so this is all done and etched. I'll turn on my flashlight here. And uh, you can see the alignment of the holes there. So you can see the, uh, the alignment is perfect. See straight through them, right down to the other side of the board. So that means that everything on the opposite side of the board came into alignment. And it does this every time. It's, there's no fluking with this. When you do that package method, it just comes out perfect like this every single time. So you can line up both sides of your circuit board and that's really how easy it is to, uh, to do a double sided circuit board. So what I'll do now is I'll get some lacquer thinner and take this toner off. A lot of people like to use acetone but the problem with acetone taking toner off, especially this HP toner, is it likes to push it into the surface of the board. So I'll, I'll use lacquer thinner and remove this. It's, it's not as harsh as uh, acetone. Acetone is great for removing flux, RA type flux after you solder the parts and it doesn't hurt anything at that point. But this toner, it seems to you know make streaks and lines inside the circuit board and it makes for a messy board. So I use lacquer thinner for this point. Uh, you also you want to use gloves whenever you're doing this kind of stuff. And you know, of course you're doing all of this at your own risk. So you have to really take care, know what you're doing with these chemicals. Do the research before you do this. Uh, that uh, ferric chloride will stain really bad if you have it around appliances or anything like that or uh, you know anything that uh, if you get any of it on there it'll stain it permanently so you have to be very very careful you don't want to get it on your hands either it's not good for you and uh, of course it'll stain you as well so uh, you need to be very very careful so so gloves are uh, a necessity and of course if you're agitating anything you want to wear eye protection and uh, you know respirators if you're doing this in an enclosed area you got to make sure that you have the right type of respirator on you don't want to inhale any any uh, uh, fumes off of any of this stuff whatsoever so you need to take care and uh, make sure that you're doing all of that correctly so just take care you're doing so all at your own risk so this is the board here what I'm going to do now is get rid of this uh, uh, toner on here and then I'll come back and I'll show you what the board looks like without the toner all right, there's just a little bit of lacquer thinner in this bowl. I got to be very careful I don't touch anything on my camera or anything with this. This, uh, this stuff just attacks plastic really bad. So, so uh, lacquer thinner, kind of scary stuff. So here we go. We've got the circuit board. I'll just drop it into here for just a second. All right, and I'll move that around. All right, so now what we're going to do is just remove the toner. You can see it already wants to just come straight off. And there you go. This is really hard to do on camera. Usually what I do is I just wet a little bit of a cloth and wipe it off, but 
this just makes it a little bit easier for the for camera's sake here so we got to be very very careful with this stuff I think it's a little bit less aggressive than um, it's a little less aggressive than uh, than uh, uh, acetone acetone is just crazy stuff it'll push the uh, it'll push the actual toner right into the um, it'll push it right into the into the circuit board so you can see here that we have a pretty much a, a clean circuit board right underneath all that toner and uh, that's how we get all those uh, pencil thin traces I guess I'm, I'm zoomed in too much here to get a uh, to get a view so I'll just uh, widen this up a little so you can see that's uh, what it looks like nice and clean there we go and the copper is exposed so now the next thing that we're going to do is I'll show you how I drill this I'm ready to drill the holes here and you can see that I've got my Dremel press here and underneath the Dremel press is a, a little light so that when I slide the board over it'll illuminate the holes in the circuit board so that way I can aim the bit for the little hole and it makes life quite a bit easier so I just added a little white LED on the bottom side I also have another one on the top that I can move into place and I can look now it's really bright in the camera but in person it's you know just average so it's, it's just a camera that's doing that but um, I can move this out of the way and then just use the bottom one so for the double sided I can just you know aim for the little white dots and, and drill it out so these are the drill bits here that I use I believe these are a tungsten carbide I'm really not sure they're incredibly hard drill bits and they work very good and they never seem to dull up so these are the little drill bits I use work very very well if you go and uh, you know buy the the uh, regular hobby store kind of a drill bit you'll end up with something like this and you know you get an okay life out of them but they dull up pretty quick so uh, I usually stick to these ones here now I broke a whole bunch of these drill bits because when I bought this press it came in sideways it was uh, this cup wasn't square and those little bits would just you know break after a couple of runs and I kept wondering why am I breaking so many bits so I ended up measuring the angle here and of course it's coming in crooked so you'd think right from the factory this thing would be straight but no it was crooked so I shimmed it up I shimmed up the little drill in the cup here because the cup doesn't sit quite square and uh, now it comes in completely straight and I haven't gone through a drill bit yet you know you end up uh, you end up doing things like this to your drill bits and that's a uh, pretty aggravating so that's how I, I drill the uh, the little circuit boards out in and I'll you know drill these holes I'll pre-drill them here and then I'll, I'll take it into the garage and I'll drill these out to the appropriate size like you know 632 or something like that and then of course uh, you, you know I still have the indexing here on the side so I draw a line with a pencil and I'll take this to the bandsaw and then I'll cut this right along the line here and then after I have this thing completely drilled, I have one more process to do. And uh, I'm not going to drill this because I'm not going to use this right now. But uh, what I'll do is I'll show you the last process and um, we'll go from there. All right, so I'm going to try and catch this last process on camera. So I have a product here called Liquid Tin. And uh, I'm not so sure if my camera is going to focus on it. It's made by MG Chemicals. And uh, this is what I use to tin the circuit boards. So this stuff is a pretty nasty chemical and you want to be very careful with this stuff. So always wear gloves and the proper, you know, face protection and everything like that. You don't want to get any of this stuff on you. And it, uh, it has a pretty nasty egg smell to it. So, so I'll see if I can get this on camera here. If you can watch the, um, watch what's going on in here. You can see it pretty much just instantly tins and that's where my circuit boards get that nice shiny tin coat from is from this liquid tin compound and that protects the traces as well that's a very important thing to have on the traces because you know copper oxidizes very very fast and by doing this it um, 
you know, it, it really helps preserve the circuit board and uh, keep everything safe. And it also makes it just a little bit easier to solder. Well, this is so they say. I find that it, you know, protects the traces. I find that copper, you know, when it's in the state that it was there, it, uh, you know, it, it solders very, very nicely. But, um, you know, this stuff here, it, it's a good thing to do just to preserve the copper on the circuit board. And then what you do is you just let this sit for about five minutes or so. And after you're done, what you do is you get a little funnel and you very carefully put this back into the bottle again and you can use the liquid tin over and over and over and over again. I've probably used this bottle, oh, I can't, uh, I can't imagine how many times. So it's, uh, you know, I've had this bottle for years and years. So it works very, very well and it keeps on tinning. So um, that's how my uh, circuit boards get that nice little uh, that tin coat on them. Well, I hope you enjoyed this little circuit board tutorial. If you did, you can let me know by giving me a big thumbs up. And hang around. There'll be more stuff like this coming up in the very near future. So take care. Bye for now.